Mendel's work with peas turned out to be using a very simple system and a very simple model. Uh, he developed his laws, which, knowing what we know now, really should be considered more principles than laws because there are a great many exceptions. Many inherited traits result from modes of inheritance that differ from strict, dominant, and recessive relationships. Phenotypes can result from alleles with a range of dominance, from the combined effect of more than one gene, or from genes that have more than just two alleles within a population. Scientists study the patterns of traits or phenotypes uh, within families and populations in order to determine how genes are inherited. The first major exceptions to Mendel's principles are that there are few traits that are actually expressed in a simple dominant recessive relationship. And there's two types of situations where that becomes significantly important. The first is incomplete dominance. An incomplete dominance situation, the heterozygous condition expresses a third phenotype, which is different from either homozygous condition. Uh, the most common example of this is in snapdragons. If you breed a red snapdragon with a white snapdragon, they produce a pink snapdragon. But if I breed two of those pink heterozygous snapdragons, I end up seeing offspring that are red, pink, and white. The F2 genotypic ratio matches the F2 phenotypic ratio. I have a third different phenotype appear, and I'm in a 1 to 2 to 1 relationship. Codominance is a bit different. In this case, both phenotypes are expressed completely separately, not blended like they were in incomplete dominance. So blood type is the most common example of this. If I have two A alleles, I have type A blood. If I have two B alleles, I have type B blood. If I have an A and a B allele, I have type AB blood. They're both expressed completely separately. So type A blood only has antigens on the surface for type A. B has antigens for type B, whereas AB expresses both separately so that I am both type A and type B at the same time. This is why it's a universal recipient, because it has the receptors on the outside to acknowledge both A and B, and it doesn't destroy itself. Type O blood is the universal donor, because it has no antigens, it's not rejected by any person's body. What we see overall is that the A allele is co-dominant to the B allele, but both of them are dominant compared to the lowercase i or O allele. Another exception is that many traits are controlled by more than two alleles or one location. Uh, if I have more than two alleles for a gene, while it's still typically inherited as a pair because we are diploid organisms, there could be more than two, which we just saw with O. So with blood type, there were three alleles, but you still only inherited two. Polygenic traits are a bit different. Polygenic traits are traits that are controlled by two or more genes. Uh, this trait often shows a great variety of phenotypes. Uh, uh, skin color is the most common example of this. Polytraits are continuous traits with no distinct categories. So there's a wide variety which covers a very broad spectrum. Uh, traditionally, you could think of it as if they were on a bell curve. Uh, height, skin color, eye color, weight, intelligence, all of these things are things that could be considered polygenic. And so that histogram shape that the continuous trait will show uh, the bell curve shows the majority of data points are near the average, with fewer and fewer data points as you move away from the average, and that would be a polygenic condition. The interaction among genes and organisms can be highly variable, so the third major exception here. Pleiotropic traits are when one gene has multiple effects. Uh, cystic fibrosis, for example, while it is a mutation of a single gene, causes changes in the lungs and wide variety of other conditions. Sickle cell anemia changes the blood cell, which changes body behaviors and energy levels and oxygen carrying and a wide variety of other conditions. So pleiotropy, one gene with multiple effects. Epistasis, you have two or more genes that control a single trait. Uh, what one gene is going to prevent the expression of another. The example given here is in Labrador retrievers. We can see that regardless of what the B allele is, if the Labrador Retriever has two recessive E alleles, then they will be yellow labs. What's actually going on here is that the B alleles control the color of the pigment, but the E allele controls the amount of pigments produced. So it doesn't matter what color the lab would have been, if they don't produce pigments, they are going to be a yellow lab. And you can actually tell the difference between the B alleles if you look at the nose and eyelid colors of the dog. So in this example, in the yellow lab below, has a very dark 
nose, and eye rims. So there's probably a heterozygous B going on here. Maybe homozygous, we don't know. Another thing that varies here is that some diseases have different penetrance and expressivity. Penetrance is the likelihood of expressing a phenotype, and expressivity is the extent to which it is expressed. So you can have reduced penetrance. So while you have the disease or the mutation, you don't actually develop the disorder. You can also have variable expressivity. So you may have the disease, but you may not have it as bad as someone else. Uh, a common example of this is Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a disease with 100% penetrance, no reduced penetrance at all, but the variable expressivity is very high, and you can have very little condition effects or very many. Another major exception is that the environment can lead to major changes in an organism. When you go out and get a tan, you've changed your skin color, which we know is an epistatic trait. Is it a permanent change? No, but you have changed your phenotype for at least a little while. Um, and this ties into things like fur color of animals in the Arctic, and it's all a temperature differential. If the temperature changes, the pigments change, and so you're going to have different color fur or hydrangeas. When you change the pH of the soil, you change the color of the flowers. This goes into this idea of nature versus nurture, and what we see, and looking at human data especially, uh, twin studies, we can see that it's not really nature versus nurture. Instead, we need to realize that we are a combination of both and that our environment plays a major role on our phenotypes. Another major exception is that some genes can travel together in a process called gene linkage. It could be genes that are just close together on the same chromosome, um, but that can be made untrue through crossing over. Uh, more commonly, when we talk about some genes traveling together, we're talking about sex link traits or traits that are on the X or the Y chromosome. Most uh, sex link traits are X link traits because the Y chromosome doesn't really carry very much. Um, but males with recessive X link diseases are going to show those diseases because they only have one X chromosome. Females, however, with two X chromosomes won't. They will instead be carriers. So with sex link traits, they only go on the X chromosomes. So males are going to have a lot harder time dealing with this. To actually study this relationship, we need to use a process called pedigree analysis to reveal the patterns of human inheritance. So pedigree charts are going to be allowing us to follow patterns of inheritance within a family tree. Uh, in a pedigree chart, squares represent males, circles represent females, and colored in represents that they have the disease. So in the top example, pedigree example one, we have a family with an autosomal dominant genetic trait. The gene for this particular trait does not occur on the sex chromosome. It occurs on an autosomal chromosome because both males and females have the trait. This can be inferred from two facts. Because the father has the trait, if the trait were sex-linked on the father's X chromosome, then all females would have the trait. However, because some females do not have the trait, it is not sex-linked. If I look at individual 3-7, as a male child who did not inherit the trait from the mother, who has the trait. So he received his only X chromosome from his mother. This particular gene is a dominant gene because each of the people who have the trait has only one parent who has the trait. If only one parent has the trait and the trait is not sex linked, then the individual who have the trait must be heterozygous for the gene. Therefore, it cannot be um, recessive. In the second example, we have a family with a recessive sex linked genetic trait. The gene for this particular trait is sex-linked and recessive. This can be inferred because only males have the trait, and males are much more likely to show sex-linked recessive diseases. The trait skips a generation. That's another good sign for recessiveness. In generation two, all of the offspring receive an X chromosome from their mother. Because the males only receive the X chromosome from their mother, they do not receive the gene carrying the trait. Because the females receive an X chromosome from their mother and their father, they are probably heterozygous. Well, they have to be, because the father would have to have it on his X. And so they are going to be carriers for this trait and passing it on to their offspring, which we can see in generation three. Another thing that Mendel never knew is that some traits are not determined by chromosomes. You have some genes that are not in your nucleus or part of your chromosomes. For us, that would be the mitochondria. And those genes are going to be inherited matrilineally. 
you only get mitochondria from your mother, therefore she is going to have an effect on those genes. Another example is epigenetics. And epigenetics is a new field in genetics that's going to be of major importance in coming generations, but it's heritable changes in gene expression caused by mechanisms other than changes in the DNA. There are three major uh, branches of epigenetics, if you will. Um, many more are being discovered as over time, but genomic imprinting is one where we realize that which parent a gene comes from matters. If you inherit gene A from dad versus gene A from mom, it's going to have a different expression. And that was fairly new information. Uh, another example is methylation versus acetylation. If you add a methyl group to DNA, it's going to silence the gene. It's going to prevent the gene from expressing because it's going to prevent the enzymes from being able to read that gene. Whereas acetylation will do the opposite. So by acetylating, the histones will be relaxed, the chromatin will spread out, and the enzymes will be able to read that section much simpler, and so that gene will be activated.